Welcome to the PA Books podcast. PA Books is a production of PCN, the Pennsylvania Cable Network. This program features interviews with authors of books on Pennsylvania people, history, sports, business, nature, and politics. While the focus is always on Pennsylvania, topics like the Revolutionary War, the Battle of Gettysburg, the Industrial Revolution, the coal and steel industries, and authors like John Updike, David McCullough, and John Grogan have a universal appeal. We hope you enjoy this podcast. This week on PA Books, the author of Gettysburg, The Last Invasion, Alan Gelzo. Alan Gelzo, author of Gettysburg, The Last Invasion. Your book is dedicated to Second Lieutenant Jonathan E. Gelzo, U.S. Army, in remembrance of all the days we have walked the fields of Gettysburg together. Who is he? That is my son. He is uh, an Army officer right now, stationed at Fort Benning, and he is driving tanks, which I hope will not have a negative impact on his normal everyday driving skills. But he and I, when he was a boy growing up, we made pilgrimage after pilgrimage to Gettysburg and wandered over the battlefield. We would take certain sections of it and spend several hours just tramping around and getting a, a feel of what it was like. What was it about, what is it about that site that brings you back all the time? The first time I visited Gettysburg was 1975. And I remember walking up on the ramp to the overlook at the old Cyclorama Center, which is now gone, looking around, and it was the strangest sensation because I recognized everything. You know, I'd grown up reading all about Gettysburg, never have actually having been there, but reading about it and reading about it. And then actually that spring day in 75, walking up on that ramp and looking around, suddenly I recognized everything. It was like, oh, that's the little round top. Oh, that's the clump of trees. Ah, that's Seminary Ridge. So it was a little deja vu. And I suppose in real terms, this book was probably born on that day. I might not have been very conscious of it, but probably that's where the first seed was planted. Was your son interested in these walks, or did you have to kind of drag him along? Oh, no, no. He enjoyed them, or at least he didn't complain about them. <laughs> Maybe he will say something different if you get him on the program here and ask him himself. But we had a wonderful time. I suppose people, in psychological terms, would call it a bonding experience. We just thought it was, well, a historical experience and it was something that we could really do together and enjoy. My father was career army, and it's interesting to see the jump of the generation and my son being in the army. He had actually been in the Marines first, right out of high school. He enlisted in the Marines, did his four years with them and two tours in Iraq uh, in the process. Came back, went to college, got into Army ROTC, and went through and came out with a commission, and now he's, he's in the Army. So you might say he's uh, continuing a generational tradition. And you became a professor? Yes, and isn't that the strangest thing, but a professor who winds up writing about the Civil War, and particularly this book about Gettysburg, which is really a book, as much as it's about anything else, it's about the soldiers who fought in that battle and looking at the battle very much from their perspective. Well, that's the, the, the point. You, when you take on a topic like Gettysburg, about which so much has been written, how do you make it interesting? There are a number of ways of writing military history, but the conventional way of doing it tends to be the Julius Caesar school of writing, or at least that's what I call it in class, in which all the focus is at the very top, what the leadership does, what the leadership decides. Caesar did this, Caesar did that, Caesar did the other. That's the way Caesar wrote his, his commentaries. And that has shaped a lot of the writing of military history, so that sometimes what you feel like you're reading is a kind of account of a chess game being played by, a, by two chess masters. That doesn't really say very much about the experience of the chess pieces. But then again, those pieces are inanimate, so who cares? That's different with armies. It's different with soldiers. Soldiers are human beings, and they have their own unique experience of what combat, of what battle is like. This was something that came home to me 
in a meaningful way in the mid-70s when I first read John Keegan's great book, The Face of Battle, which was the beginning of what subsequently became called the new military history. And it was an effort to talk not so much about strategy, generals, as it was to talk about the texture, the feel, the experience of battle and how it had changed over the centuries. And Keegan focused on, f on three major events. Agincourt in 1415, Waterloo in 1815, and the Somme in 1916. And used those three benchmarks as a way of measuring how this experience of battle for the ordinary soldier had changed so much. Keegan stood at the head of a number of extremely innovative British military historians, including two that I, I've profoundly admired, Paddy Griffith, who wrote directly about American battle tactics in the Civil War, and, um, and, and uh, um, Richard Holmes, whose books on the experience of the ordinary British soldier in India, in the First World War, in the 18th century, extremely useful and extremely eye-opening as to what it was to be a soldier in a variety of conflicts. That's what I wanted to do with Gettysburg. What was the experience of this battle like for the soldiers, Union and Confederate, who experienced it? What did it sound like? What did it look like? What did it, um, in some cases, taste like? And what did impacted that have on the fact that this is also a battle which is being fought around a town filled with civilians? What was their experience like? So while there is the, the requisite element here of saying General X went here and General Y went here, what I'm really most concerned about is what was the soldier doing? What was the soldier experiencing in the middle of the maelstrom of the battle we call Gettysburg? How do you find out what that was? Well, the American 19th century was a highly literate society. And one of the boons conferred by a literate society is that people feel the need to leave written memoir, to write letters, to compose diaries. And soldiers who were involved in this battle did so in really extraordinary amounts, partly because they could, because so many of them were literate, and partly because at the end of this battle, so many of them really had a sense that they had been through a particularly important historical event and wanted to get some record of it down on paper. They, they did this after the battle, they did this in some cases while the battle was still going on, and then they continued to do it for 40 years and more after the battle uh, until the very last of them was gone. Are there some you can think of that stand out in your minds as being just extraordinary descriptions? One that always takes my attention is the memoir of Oliver Wilcox Norton, who was the bugler for a strong Vincent's brigade in the Fifth Corps of the Army of the Potomac. He left a memoir entitled The Attack and Defense of Little Round Top. It's not what I would call the most polished or literate kind of memoir, but it abounds in detail, observation. As the brigade bugler, he accompanied the brigadier, uh, Strong Vincent. So he had a commander's point of view but saw it with the eyes of a soldier. And he made, after the, the battle, a serious effort to collect and, um, material that he, from other soldiers that he'd fought with, contacted them, got their reminiscences, and compiled this, this really extraordinary document. One of the more unusual books this way is the Regimental History of the 83rd Pennsylvania Volunteers, uh, which was written by Amos Judson. This book was actually published as early as 1865, so it's not exactly long-term and sometimes stale memory at work. Judson wrote this regimental memoir of the 83rd Pennsylvania almost in the spirit of Mark Twain. There are chapters in this which are absolutely rollicking in their humor, particularly the chapter on the reasons why soldiers enlisted, how they became patriots. The tongue is firmly clenched in his teeth. Uh, or rather in his cheek, and, and, and yes, yeah, sometimes it does sound like he is biting with his teeth, too. But um, 
his portrayal of soldier motivations, of course, it's anything but elevated. Why did someone enlist? Well, he got into an argument with his wife at home, and despite her, he enlisted. Or this young man had uh, made some infraction of the family rules, and his governor got out the, uh, the whip and gave him a taste of it on the backside, and he ran off and became a soldier. And there were all other kinds of motivations, none of them particularly noble. But Judson said, ah, but they all became patriots. So that humor with which he approached the subject of his, of his comrades is really an extraordinary moment in not just this huge mass of, of memoir, but it's, it's really something of an American classic. I've often wondered why the Civil War regimental history is not more often treated as a literary genre of its own by the people who write about it and, and analyze American literature. Now, I'm a history person, not a, not a literature professor. But it seems to me that there's something that really wants to be done that way uh, about this very uh, widespread but very unexamined slice of American writing called the Civil War Regimental History. Is that a, an official publication? Uh, official? No, none of these were, were strictly speaking, official. <laughs> it was, uh, in fact, privately published in Erie, Pennsylvania in 1865. has sometimes been republished by small reprint houses that specialize available? in Civil War uh, literature. I don't know if it's available right at the moment, but I know it has been comparatively recently. One edition that I have of Judson's history comes oh, from the mid-90s, so at least as recently as that. And Oliver Wilcox Norton's Attack and Defensive Little Round Top has been repeatedly reprinted over the years. How often do you come across one original document, one uh, first-hand accounting, and that completely conflicts with another first-hand accounting? All the time. Because, for one thing, these soldiers, in the midst of combat, were mostly concerned about survival. And in that environment, your universe contracts to a circle about 18 inches around you. So your attention, your preoccupation, it's not with everything that is going on in a battle. You can't see that, and you don't have the luxury of, of focusing on it. What you can only talk about with any kind of authority is what you've actually experienced inside the shell of that circle. So sometimes when soldiers did try to write something a little bit more ambitious, they ended up writing what would conflict with someone else also trying to write outside that bubble. Sometimes that makes for some funny contradictions. Sometimes it can make for real puzzlement because you're trying to figure out why so-and-so is saying this happened and so-and-so is saying that happened. Then you look at them and you realize, no, I don't think that either of these people really saw that. They heard about it from someone afterwards and in the process of remembering, incorporated that into their remembering and decided that they too remembered that event. But in fact, they hadn't really seen it. Another limitation that way, especially when we're talking about Gettysburg, the weapons technology of the 19th century. The ordinary soldier is still armed with a single shot muzzle-loading black powder rifle musket, which kicks out enormous fog banks of smoke so that after a fairly short while in any engagement, you can barely see any distance that's, that's meaningful. Soldiers talked about how artillery officers in the middle of a battle would have to get down on their hands and knees to peer under the, the, the fog bank of smoke in order to see where enemy soldiers were. Powder smoke like that tended to collect, especially when you had no wind blowing. It tended to collect very thickly. It was not heavy, so it would blow off. But if there was no breeze, then you could almost get moments where the powder smoke became so thick that it would, it would blot out the sun. And soldiers at Gettysburg frequently remarked on that phenomenon. Was there any breeze the days of the battle? Some of them. The first day of the battle was actually overcast with a good deal of damp and drizzle in the morning. Uh, the second day was a fairly clear day, but once the battle was joined, it didn't stay that way because there was no breeze. And the accounts that you read later in uh, the afternoon of July the 2nd simply talk about these huge sulfurous canopies of smoke that prevented people from seeing any great distance. 
And July 3rd was, was actually very similar to that. When you live in or near Gettysburg right now? Yes, in the borough of Gettysburg itself. Uh, people often say, well, you, do you live near the battlefield? No, I say I live on the battlefield. Not literally on, on Park Service property, but the town itself, of course, was occupied by Confederate soldiers during the battle. And that means that everything that was part of the borough of Gettysburg uh, was, was, in fact, part of the battlefield, broadly understood. So you, you, can, you can say with some honesty, oh, yes, I'm on the battlefield. Well, if you have visitors from out of town and they've never been to the battlefield, where do you take them? <laughs> as many places as we can cram into one day. <laughs> Very good friend of mine who came visiting from, uh, from Harvard, uh, stopped and, and we just did the day and did Gettysburg. And usually I start over on McPherson's Ridge to talk about the first day of the battle, then move down toward um, Oak Ridge where more of the first day's fighting occurred, then over to Barlow's Knoll and through the town to Cemetery Hill. That pretty much does the account of July 1st. Then we go down to the Peach Orchard, to Little Brown Top, to the Wheat Field, Culp's Hill, and talk about July 2nd. And finally, for July 3rd, we wind up right at the angle and the clump of trees uh, to talk about Pickett's Charge. By that point, we're getting on to about 4 or 5 o'clock, the sun is going down, and we're starting to think about dinner. Do you have a favorite off the beaten path site? Oh, that's hard to say. There's so much of that battlefield that I find compelling in so many different ways. It really would be hard for me to say that there's one single part of it. Every part of it has a voice that speaks to you, even some of the parts that were not necessarily fought over. Uh, one particular hill on the battlefield known as Powers Hill no one really fought there. There were three batteries of artillery parked there. But my wife and I one day went tramping over Powers Hill just because we'd never been there. And no one had ever really talked about it, that I, or at least no one that I had read. And we went fumbling back in the, in the trees and the underbrush, and we found some interesting things there. There were some markers for the units that had fought there. There was a rusted down, broken hull of an old Ford truck <laughs> and, other, <laughs> and other odds and ends which had been left there. But what struck me about that, and I'd never realized this, Powers Hill in its time in 1863 was the perfect fallback position. If some disaster occurred and the Union Army found that it was going to have to stage some kind of withdrawal, Powers Hill was the logical place from which to command that withdrawal, right beside the Baltimore Pike. Those are the kinds of things you don't always appreciate just from looking at a two-dimensional map. But when you tramp over the battlefield, then you start to see the contours of things. Then you start to see the possibilities of what can be seen, what can't be seen, what can be done, and what probably couldn't be done, even if some people claimed they could. Were there many soldiers at the battle who really never were involved in combat, never got near it? Yes, because even in the 19th century, these armies have tails. Uh, in the case of some units, cavalry units, some artillery units, they were close by, but never actually engaged. The 6th Corps of the Army of the Potomac has only minimal casualties because it spent almost all of its role in the battle in reserve and did not really engage in any kind of serious action until after the battle was over because it was the first unit to go in pursuit of Lee's retreating army. There are a few odd monuments on the battlefield that way. There's a monument there to the 84th Pennsylvania Regiment, which is peculiar because the 84th was never on the battlefield at all. The 84th Pennsylvania got the ticket to guard the supply train head at Westminster, Maryland. And that was where they spent the Battle of Gettysburg. But their argument after the battle was the job we performed in guarding the railhead at Westminster was just as important as what anyone else did at Gettysburg, so we deserve a monument. And sure enough, there's a monument on the battlefield to the 84th Pennsylvania, even though they never really fought there. There's a lot in your book that we could talk about. I want to just 
make sure we have time to bring up a couple of them that, that jumped out. One is you talked about Philadelphia had been the great emporium of Southern commerce, recalled Alexander McClure. Although it had been the home of the earliest American anti-slavery society, the election of 1860, Philadelphia gave Abraham Lincoln only a token majority of 2,000 votes out of over 76,000. If the union is to be divided, announced Pennsylvania Supreme Court Justice George Woodward, I want the line of separation to run north of Pennsylvania. It's extraordinary to think that Pennsylvania, a free state, Keystone State, in the Civil War with a loyal Republican governor like Andrew Gregg Curtin, that Pennsylvanians could think in terms like that. But there were many Pennsylvanians who did. Sometimes the, the motion motivation was, was strictly political, as in George Woodward, uh, who was running for governor as a Democrat against uh, Curtin in 1863. Sometimes it grew out of indifference. People in Adams County, for instance, were overwhelmingly democratic in their political allegiance. They really wanted nothing to do with the war. It didn't, in the long run, really matter a whole lot to them whether the North won or the South won, so long as they could continue in their quiet agricultural lives undisturbed. In Philadelphia, again, division of opinion. The mayor of Philadelphia, uh, Alexander Henry, uh, very strong in support of the Union. And yet there were elements of Philadelphia's population, especially the commercial elements, which had strong economic ties to the South. And self-interest in that respect tended to be the tail that wagged the dog. And you had a lot of dissidents, very critical of the war, coming out of Philadelphia. Of course, Philadelphia gives us maybe our most famous Civil War, Pennsylvania Civil War general, and that's George McClellan. But then again, George McClellan himself wasn't exactly renowned as being someone who wanted to prosecute the war with the kind of vigor that Abraham Lincoln expected it to be. Do you have some accusations toward him, if that's what the, the right word to use, that he wanted to just kind of play a stalling game until both sides negotiated a peace? Was there in large measure, that? in large measure, yes. George McClellan came from a very prominent Philadelphia family. If you'd asked anybody in the 1850s who George McClellan was, they would probably have told you, oh, you mean the doctor because George McClellan Sr. was a nationally famous surgeon, one of the founders of the Thomas Jefferson Hospital in Philadelphia. His son shared the family political loyalties, which were originally conservative Whig and then became Democratic. And George McClellan himself, after his service in the Army, after he resigned from the Army and took a job with the Illinois Central Railroad, uh, met Abraham Lincoln in Illinois but gave all of his uh, political allegiance, not to Lincoln, but in 1858 to Lincoln's opponent for the Senate, Stephen A. Douglas. And many people believed that McClellan, in fact, had helped provide uh, Douglas with special services on the railroad using railroads, uh, executive uh, cars. So McClellan comes into this fight convinced that it's important to restore the Union, but also increasingly persuaded that Abraham Lincoln is as much a danger to the restoration of the Union as Jefferson Davis and the Confederates. Because Abraham Lincoln has been taken over by the abolitionists and he is going to put the price of peace so high that Southerners will never agree to it. And in that respect, what Lincoln has done has allowed, Lincoln has allowed radicalism to run away with him. And that was McClellan's point of view. McClellan saw himself as the mainstream as the middle of the road, the one who was really concerned about saving the Union. Lincoln and the radicals were only concerned about abolition. So McClellan saw himself as the one best positioned and best anointed to bring about the reunion of North and South, which is an incredible position for an American military officer to put himself into. But McClellan's ego was of such a nature that he had no difficulty in seeing himself, preening himself in his own psychological mirror uh, as the savior of the Union. And there were moments when people suspected in the fall of 1862 that George McClellan might just be fully as willing to use the Army of the Potomac to pull the chain of Abraham Lincoln as to pull the chain of Jefferson Davis, to stage some kind of political intervention using the Army of the Potomac in Washington. 
This is one reason why in November, Lincoln sacks McClellan. But even as McClellan takes his farewell of the army, the soldiers are cheering him and crying out, lead us to Washington, General, we'll, we'll follow you. If anyone could have contemplated some kind of coup d'etat, George McClellan was certainly the man best positioned to do that and the man who had talked the most about it. Now, the fortunate thing, of course, is that McClellan was no better at political action than he was at military action, so nothing like that happened. But McClellan will run against Lincoln for the presidency in 1864. Did he carry Pennsylvania? When no. He ran against Lincoln? He did not. No, because by the time the election takes place, public opinion has set in so strongly for Lincoln that not even in Pennsylvania are the majority of the voters going to go for McClellan. But that's 1864. 1863, it's a different story. And in the Army of the Potomac, McClellan has left behind him a very large and very influential cadre of senior officers, people whom he has raised up to these positions, who continue to be imbued with McClellan's sentiments. And this is going to make tremendous difficulties for Lincoln in trying to prod the Army of the Potomac into some kind of decisive conflict, some kind of battle which will bring the war to an end. And, Link and Lincoln suspects in this, in this regard that many of the officers of the Army of the Potomac are actually somewhat politically unreliable and will pull their punches rather than deliver a victory that would serve the interests of Lincoln and the radical Republicans. Well, when, when Lincoln replaced McClellan uh, with there's uh, Hooker and Burnside and then Meade, uh, did they clean house with the other officers? No. No, that would have been too disruptive. What happens is that when McClellan is dismissed in November of 1862, he's replaced by Ambrose Burnside. Burnside was a good friend of McClellan's, but he was also a diligent officer in a lot of ways. He meant to do well. His problem was that he was not entirely the brightest bulb in the chandelier. And it was very easy for the other McClellanites in the army to turn an accusing finger at Burnside and treat Burnside as though somehow Burnside was responsible for McClellan's dismissal. And in many cases, fold their arms and withhold their cooperation. This was illustrated dramatically at the Battle of Fredericksburg, where one of McClellan's favorites, William B. Franklin, basically says, well, I don't really understand Burnside's orders, so therefore I'm, I'm really not going to be very effective in carrying this out. I'm not going to be very aggressive. And so he isn't, and the battle is lost, lost catastrophically. Well, Lincoln, after relieving Burnside of command, then goes to the other extreme. He's not going to appoint a friend of McClellan's to try to placate, placate the McClellanites. He's going to appoint a friend of the administration who will run roughshod over the McClellanites. And so he appoints Joseph Hooker. And Joe Hooker is no more successful at whipping the McClellanites into line uh, than Burnside had been. And <laughs> in fact, he's even less effective in dealing with Robert E. Lee and the Confederates. And that leaves Lincoln in the position in June of 1863 where no one has any confidence in Joe Hooker anymore. Who's going to be put in place? Lincoln actually goes down through a number of the corps commanders of the Army of the Potomac, offers them command, and they turn him down. Until finally, on June 28th, Lincoln orders. He doesn't ask. He orders George G. Meade to take command. Another Philadelphian. Another Philadelphian, very close to the McClellans. The families knew each other quite well. And Meade himself owed his promotion owed his appointment in the Army of the Potomac to George McClellan, stays in touch with McClellan, meets with McClellan. After the Battle of Gettysburg, in fact, will receive a congratulatory letter from George McClellan. So in the case of, of George Meade, here is someone whom Lincoln basically has to settle for. Meade is not Lincoln's ideal. And his political allegiances certainly make the relationship between the two men a very dicey one. When Meade took over the army, did he know that the big battle was looming? Well, he knew that an invasion was in the process because when he's appointed to command on June 28, 1863, Lee's army is already in Pennsylvania. Joe Hooker, in fact, had been in the process of pursuing Lee 
and there was some expectation that there was going to have to be a confrontation somewhere. But when Meade takes command of the army, Meade's first instinct is to draw the army together and assume a defensive position. Meade looks to bring the army together along the banks of Pipe Creek in northern Maryland. Pipe Creek's a tributary of the Monocacy River, which then flows into the Potomac. And it was, in fact, a very good defensive position. Right behind it was that railhead town of Westminster, so that would have given Meade very good supply communications back to Baltimore, Washington, and Philadelphia. But uh, that's not really what Lincoln wants to see the Army of the Potomac doing. Meade thinks that his mandate is cover Baltimore and Washington, not go after Robert E. Lee. So it's a very cautious and a very defensive-minded position. And many people have said, well, you know, what can you expect? The man's only been in command three days. Give him a break. And, and there is truth in that because, uh, for one thing, being in command, thrust into it in the way that he was, Meade had no time to appoint staff officers of his own choosing, no time to do any kind of rearranging. He basically had to run the machinery as he found it. And it was something like being put in charge of a runaway locomotive as, as it's about to go spilling over uh, the side of a, of a ravine. But on the other hand, Meade certainly did not have a lot of personal affection for Lincoln or the Lincoln administration. And he will regard his own position as being a very, very fragile one. His attitude toward Lincoln will be, look, Lincoln and the radical Republicans have taken such a stance, such an uncompromising stance toward the war and toward Democrats, that if I do get into a battle with Lee and I win, I'll get no credit for it. Whereas if I get into a battle and lose, my head will be on a pike and that's the end of my career. Does he get credit for it? Well, I think in large measure he does get some. He does get some. Not, however, the kind of enthusiastic applause that you might expect would be given to some other commanders. In a sense, it almost becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy because Meade is so cautious that after the Battle of Gettysburg, he's very, very careful, very prudent about his pursuit of Lee and the defeated Confederate army, so much so that he allows them to escape across the Potomac, at which point Lincoln writes a scathing letter, a letter which he never actually sends, thinks better of it, files it away. But the sense of it got communicated to Meade all the same through military channels. Meade is furious, threatens to resign on the spot. Lincoln has to placate him. No, 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 I appreciate the victory that you won. I'm happy with the victory, and so on and so forth. Privately, though, Lincoln kept saying, we had them in the palm of our hand. All we had to do was close our fingers. They would have been ours, and the war would have been over. Did, did Meade out General Lee to win the war, or was it just kind of the way things fell? I don't think so. I think it's a case where the Battle of Gettysburg was much more lost by Robert E. Lee than it was won by George G. Meade. I mean, for one thing, Meade is not there on the first day of the battle. When the battle begins, Meade is in Tawnytown, Maryland, and he's trying to make these arrangements for the concentration at Pipe Creek. It actually comes as something of a surprise to Meade when he receives word on the morning of July 1st that three of the Army Corps of the Army of the Potomac have in fact begun an engagement at Gettysburg. Those three corps were under the command of John F. Reynolds from Lancaster. Reynolds had, in large measure, bolted ahead of his leash. After all, George Meade had been his peer only two, three days before. And Reynolds confessed himself dismayed by Meade's plan to concentrate behind Pipe Creek because Reynolds believed that was going to give Lee and the rebels a free hand to run rampant through Pennsylvania. So Lee was north of, of yeah, Meade at that point? that's right. So Reynolds' concern is that, in fact, uh, Lee is going to be given a free ticket to loot the Pennsylvania countryside. And as a man from central Pennsylvania, Reynolds simply did not want that to happen. So Reynolds, in fact, moves ahead to Gettysburg. The last message he sends back to George Meade is, in effect, while I understand that 
you had not desired an engagement here. Nevertheless, based on my reading of the situation, I have taken it on my own authority to begin a battle here. So in, in large measure, the Battle of Gettysburg is really begun by, by John Reynolds, who was killed at the outset. And Meade does not catch up with the battle itself until the wee hours of the morning on July 2nd, when he finally reaches Gettysburg from Tawnytown. Who was it who was responsible for the Union Army landing up on Cemetery Hill and having the high ground? Once Reynolds was killed, and he was killed really within an hour of the beginning of the battle by a Confederate skirmisher, command then falls to a general to whom we don't often give a whole lot of credit, and that is Oliver Otis Howard, who was the commander of the 11th Corps at the Battle of Gettysburg. The 11th Corps had something of a checkered military history. They had not performed terribly well the Battle of Chancellorsville two months before. Many people blamed that on the fact that the 11th Corps was mainly composed of German immigrants. I mean, at least half of the 11th Corps were German. Some, some units, they, the officers were still giving orders in German. And Otis Howard had been in command of the 11th Corps. It was his first corps command. And no one questioned Howard's personal bravery, but once the 11th Corps broke and ran at Chancellorsville, there was really very little chance of getting them to, uh, to stop and rally. Well, people held that against Howard, but they also held that against the 11th Corps. Still at Gettysburg, when command falls to Otis Howard to take charge of the situation, he actually does very well. He deploys what troops he's got. He holds off the Confederates for most of the afternoon until finally overwhelming Confederate numbers crack the, the Union defenses. And it's Howard who makes it clear, we're going to stand on Cemetery Hill. And it's Howard who rescues Cemetery Hill for the Army of the Potomac instead of seeing Gettysburg turn into a second Chancellorsville. And that's important because Cemetery Hill is really the most important geographical location on the battlefield. Cemetery Hill is unlike the rest of the topography of South Central Pennsylvania. Most of South Central Pennsylvania is, you know, if you, if you work eastward from the Appalachians, from South Mountain, for instance, it, it kind of descends in these ridge lines, slowly moving toward the Susquehanna River. Cemetery Hill is different from that. Cemetery Hill is a broad, flat, plateau, which means it's a perfect artillery platform for 19th century artillery. Both Howard and Reynolds had been artillery officers. They saw the value of that. And Howard was determined to hold on to Cemetery Hill, which he does successfully. When Meade arrives about 2 in the morning on July 2nd, Union forces are still occupying Cemetery Hill, and that's really the gift that, uh, that Otis Howard makes to the Union Army at Gettysburg. If they had not taken Cemetery Hill on the first day, could they have won the battle? Probably not. They probably couldn't have even fought it anywhere there. They probably would have had to evacuate the remnants of the 1st Corps and the 11th Corps to Pipe Creek, and Meade would have tried to make a stand there. But the ramifications of some kind of one-day defeat at Gettysburg, that would have been treated in the Northern press and by Northern public opinion as being yet another depressing, debasing defeat of the Union Army. Uh, we are, I wish we had all day to talk, but before we run out of time, I do want to ask about a couple of things in your book. There's a, a chapter you have called The Supreme Moment of the War Had Come, and I guess that's talking about the peach orchard. And you have a, a paragraph in there that says that at that moment it seemed to both Barksdale and Humphreys that the entire federal left flank was caving in and that the road to Cemetery Hill was yawning open and that the most complete victory of the war was beckoning to them. Yes. How many of those pivotal moments did you find and why, why was that the, the supreme moment of the war? But One of the thing I, things about Gettysburg that I think is so compelling as a story and has been so compelling to people over the 150 years since the battle has been that Gettysburg is full of these split-second moments when a decision made one way or the other, when a time frame of 15 minutes makes all the difference to the whole story of the battle. It's the kind of thing that keeps happening over and over and over again at Gettysburg and makes the story of Gettysburg such a, a continuously edge-of-the-seat experience. 
but especially on July 2nd, and we're talking perhaps around 5 o'clock in the afternoon of July 2nd, James Longstreet's great flank attack has jumped off. It's been tremendously successful. It's overrun the Union Third Corps down at Devil's Den, down at Hawks Ridge, rolled up the wheat field, destroyed the federal positions on the, at the Peach Orchard. The last remnants of the Third Corps line along the Emmitsburg Road are beginning to, to fragment and float backwards. And at that moment, officer after officer in the Confederate Army says, this is it. This is going to be the battle. It's going to be decided right here. And if it's decided right here, we are going to win and the war is going to be over. And Barksdale thinks that way. Porter Alexander, who, an artillery officer in the Confederate Army, who brings up Confederate artillery to the Peach Orchard at that point, says, we thought the war was now going to be decided, that all we had to do was just keep pressing, that the entire Federal Army would fall apart the same way the Third Corps was going apart, Cemetery Hill would fall, we would be triumphant, the Army of the Potomac would be dashed to pieces, and that would be it. They would be forced to negotiate, and we would have our independence. And at that moment, it came so close, so close that an hour later, after the Third Corps seemed to have gone to pieces, Winfield Scott Hancock turns around, looks for Union troops to throw into the gap, and can find only one regiment, the 1st Minnesota. He says, my God, is this all that we have? And he turns to the colonel of the 1st Minnesota, about 250 men in that regiment, and he points to a Confederate brigade descending on. We're talking about odds of something like eight to one. And he says, do you see those Confederate colors? Take them. First Minnesota doesn't bat an eye. Fix bayonets and right into the charge they go. They get decimated, more than decimated. Uh, at the end of the day, there's only about 80 of them left. But they stop that Confederate charge in its tracks. And when the sun goes down on July 2nd, over and over again, the Confederates have come just down to the one yard line, but they can't get the ball into the end zone. And that's where the second day of the battle ends with just having come agonizingly close to have destroyed the Union Army, but not having quite done it and resolving, all right, the next day, July 3rd, we're going to do it. Well, also the second day was the, uh, the 20th Maine and Joshua Chamberlain. Do they deserve all the credit they got? Well, they certainly deserve credit, and Chamberlain deserves credit. I mean, here was a man with no military experience. He had been a professor of rhetoric at Bowdoin College, and he just, he does the right thing at the right time. Some strange instinct inside him that he obeys. The important thing to see, though, is that Chamberlain is really just one in a series of similar officers and similar units that make the same kind of split-second decisions on their own hook on their own initiative, and somehow miraculously doing the right thing time and time again. So it's not only Joshua Chamberlain. I mean, all credit to Joshua Chamberlain. We focused entirely too much just on him. The decision he made at Little Round Top was replicated over and over again by people like Patty O'Rourke, also at Little Round Top, George Sears Green over on Culp's Hill, uh, just even the first Minnesota. Those kinds of decisions that were being made by people without direction, just obeying some kind of, of brute sense of what the right thing to do at that right moment was, that just kept happening all over the battlefield. Now, I recognize you can only make a movie with one major character in it. <laughs> so so the, the, the movie Gettysburg focuses just on Chamberlain and, and Little Round Top. But to really appreciate what happens, you've got to see that that situation occurred over and over and over again on July 2nd. Now, a, another moment like that in, in your book, you have Louis Armistead, and he, he reaches the angle and says, directly ahead, he saw the ruined guns of Cushing's battery, and behind them, Alexander Webb's last reserve regiment of the Philadelphia Brigade, the Fire Zouaves of the 72nd Pennsylvania, and beyond them, nothing nothing but daylight and victory and the destruction of the Army of the Potomac and the end of the war and independence and peace. So he lowered his sword and called, the day is ours, men. Come turn this artillery on them. The Duke of Wellington once said that the Battle of Waterloo was a near-run thing. 
and so was Gettysburg. It was a near-run thing on July 1st, on July 2nd, and on July 3rd, when Armistead and his Virginians break through the Union line at the angle. What's between them and anything else beyond? One regiment, the 72nd Pennsylvania, and maybe behind them, the provost guard, some cavalrymen. Behind them, maybe some muleteers and wagons in the Tawny Town Road. Over in Culp's Hill, there's the 12th Corps. Maybe they could have been pulled off and sent to the rescue, but they'd already been fighting all morning. How easy was it going to be to do that? At that moment, there was not a whole lot that could have prevented one last Confederate push from shoving itself all the way through and hitting Cemetery Hill from behind, causing the Federal Army to collapse in on itself and bringing about the near complete demoralization of the Army of the Potomac. It was that close. It came so near. And when you stand there at the angle and you reflect on that and how close it really was, that's when you start to get the chills. Because what would flow downstream from that? Suppose Pickett's charge had been successful. Suppose they had broken through and the Army of the Potomac simply lost it and began to disintegrate in, in retreat. What would stop the Confederate Army then from moving on Philadelphia, Baltimore, Washington? There was at that point a picket boat at Fortress Monroe in the Chesapeake Bay waiting for a signal to move up the Potomac River to Washington. On board that picket boat was the Vice President of the Confederacy, Alexander Stevens. Stevens was being sent by Jefferson Davis ostensibly on a mission to discuss prisoner exchanges. But it was very widely understood that Stevens was also there so that if a decisive battle was fought in Pennsylvania, then Stevens would be prepared to expand his mission to open peace discussions with Abraham Lincoln in Washington, D.C. How close were we to that happening? It could have been. It can't be, it can't be taken out. I, I'm not a what-if sort of person, but I, I do think that it's important to understand all the variables that were within the view of the actors themselves in 1863 and just how perilously close we could have come, what the results might have been. It's a, it's a scarifying thing to think, but soldiers afterwards said that it really was like that. One soldier speculated that if the battle had gone against the Army of the Potomac, he said most of it frankly would have disintegrated in desertion. Soldiers writing before the battle said, well, we're going to give this one more try. You know, we've had so many defeats. We're going to give this one more try. And if we don't win this next battle, we don't care. We're deserting. We're going home. If that had happened, if Robert E. Lee's army had been crossing the Susquehanna River instead of the Potomac River in retreat, then think, just 10 days after the battle, the New York City draft riots break out. There were draft riots, in fact, not only in New York City, but in a number of northern cities, Boston, for instance. Would it have been the Army of Northern Virginia, which has to restore order to New York City, rather than elements of the Army of the Potomac? Terrible thing to think about, but on the 3rd of July, could that be entirely ruled out as a possibility in people's minds? That's, that's how close we were. Why did the soldiers in the Union Army care so much about preserving the Union? I mean, it had only been together for 70 years, 75 years. Because the Union meant more than just a, a federation of political entities called states. The Union for them was synonymous with the democratic experiment itself. It wasn't just that we were a Union. It's that we were the only really freestanding, surviving democracy in the world at that point. In, in 1776, it looked like we were the, the new page in history. We were going to found a republic, and the contagion of republicanism was going to catch fire everywhere, and it looked like it was going to. France in 1789 has a revolution which in large measure is inspired by our revolution. 
but then it all spirals downhill. Go, the French Revolution goes up in smoke, and what you get instead is the dictatorship of Bonaparte. Then you get after that the Congress of Vienna, the imposition of the old order on Europe. You have failed revolutions, one after the other, uh, democratic revolutions against the aristocrats of Europe, the greatest of which was in 1848. They're all put down. In 1863, it looked like the wave of the future was not democracy, but monarchy. Because monarchists could say to people, look, if you try to create a democracy, a democracy is just a pipe dream. It's a great theory. But look, it doesn't work in practice. Look what happened in France. You get a, you get a dictator like Bonaparte. So leave the governing to us, the aristocrats. We know how to do it. We'll bring stability to your life. Now, of course, the only thing which, which, which was tended to prove them wrong was the success of the United States. So they were absolutely thrilled when the United States collapses into civil war. Here's this last democratic experiment, this bad example to their own peoples, obligingly blowing its brains out. So the aristocrats looked upon the Civil War as the justification of aristocracy and the aristocratic principle. And soldiers in the Army of the Potomac understood that. They said, what we are fighting for is we're fighting for the Union because the Union is about democracy. And we know that if it goes down here, then it's finished completely as an idea. Did Union soldiers care about the issue of slavery? Oh, yes, they did. But they do not see the Union and slavery as being in two separate boxes. For them, overarching both was this principle of democracy, what Lincoln called the proposition that all men are created equal. And to them, to restore the Union is to destroy slavery. And to destroy slavery, that's that's what you want in the union. There's no point in restoring a union if all you're going to do is get slavery back. So today, we tend to see these as two different objectives. Well, they only wanted to restore the union versus they wanted to abolish slavery. That wasn't how it was seen in 1863. In 1863, union soldiers understood that these two things were two sides of the same coin. And when they fought for the one, they were fighting for the other. I want to uh jump to the uh, end of the battle and the uh, investigation Congress had into Meade's conduct and General Sickles. Can you talk about General Sickles and just him as a character and then oh, his relationship with Meade? Mad Dan Sickles. If there was ever, as Thomas Canale calls him, an authentic American scoundrel, Dan Sickles was it. Uh, a political general, a wire puller, uh, a glad hander, People today look back and say, how could anyone have ever trusted that man? If you shook hands with him, you'd want to count your fingers afterwards. And yet, people adored him. <laughs> it's just amazing to see <laughs> the kind of loyalty that Sickles uh, aroused in people. And so much so that he recruits a brigade of troops to fight at the beginning of the Civil War, rises to Major General, and there he's in command of the Third Corps of the Army of the Potomac. George Meade despises him. He despises him because, first of all, Sickles is a politician. Me doesn't have a whole lot of use for politicians. He also despises Sickles because he's a turncoat. Sickles was a Democrat, but has now come out strongly in favor of Lincoln. Meade is not friendly to that. And when Meade takes command at Gettysburg on the 2nd of July, he parks Sickles' Third Corps way out of view way out on the left flank, where he believes Sickles cannot do any harm to his control of the army. Not realizing that, in fact, he's put Dan Sickles right in the path of the Confederate attack on July 2nd. Sickles sends frantic messages to headquarters. There are Confederates massing in the woods opposite my position. What am I supposed to do? Meade ignores them. Finally, Sickles, on his own hook, decides, well, I'm going to move my entire corps forward to the Emmitsburg Road because I think that's a better position. Actually, it wasn't a better position, but it looked like a better position. Now, he put his people, in fact, in further danger. And when Meade hears about this, well, Meade's first instinct is to try to pull Sickles back and really yank on the man. But that's the moment at which the great Confederate attack begins. So all that Meade can say is, 
uh, well, stay here and I'll try to find reinforcements for you. Sickles tries to explain himself to Meade and says, well, General, I was trying to find the high ground. And Meade, who had a volcanic temper and a really razor-sharp tongue, Meade says to him, well, look, General, you could have kept on going west and you would have found even higher mountains to put your position on. <laughs> so, you know, he just cuts Sickles right to the core there. Afterwards, I think that George Meade would have been really happy to have court-martialed Dan Sickles, except that late in the afternoon of July 2nd, a Confederate cannonball or piece of shrapnel or bullet, we're not even really sure which, comes along and whacks Dan Sickles behind the leg. Uh, it's so badly damaged, it has to be amputated. Sickles then is carried off to uh, recuperate in Washington, where he gets the ear of Lincoln and all the politicians and begins to tell them how he, Dan Sickles, saved the Army of the Potomac because George Meade was not paying attention to his left flank, but he, the great Dan Sickles, knew exactly what to do, and he won the battle at, well, you can fill in the blank. <laughs> so the, what this results in is that in the spring of 1864, the Joint Committee on the Conduct of the War in Congress, which was dominated by radical Republicans, decide to hold hearings in which uh, Sickles is witness number one against George Meade. Meade has to come in, he has to defend himself. Sometimes he defends himself a little bit more than he really should have, but that was Meade's temper. And it's, it's really a, a, an embarrassing affair for everybody who was concerned. Dan Sickles was like Tar Baby. Uh, anyone who touched him was, was end, ended up being soiled by him. Even George Meade trying to distance himself from Sickles, he still can't do it. Uh, Sickles still manages to taint George Meade's reputation. I wish we could keep on talking, but we are out of time. I, I, if people want to know more, I guess they either have to register for one of your classes at Gettysburg College. Which, you know, a lot of people do. People think that, you know, this is a college and therefore it's only for undergraduates. I get a steady number of uh, people, number of retirees, for instance, uh, who will audit uh, some of these classes, and uh, they, they add an element to it that I enjoy because some of them are coming with uh, a lifetime of experience and sometimes in the military. And if you can't register for one of your classes, you could read this book, Gettysburg, The Last Invasion. Alan Gelso, thank you very much. Well, thank you. You've been listening to a podcast of PA Books, a production of PCN, the Pennsylvania Cable Network. We'd like to hear from you. Our email address is pabooks at pcntv.com. Like us on Facebook to learn more about PA Books.